Thank you, Dr. Moore. <coughs> Friends, please continue. Um, and uh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt the discussion. And uh, I do want to start with a, a word of gratitude. Um, Lauren, thank you for doing the technical work. I hope you get some dinner. It's very, very good. Thank you for everybody who planned and prepared the meal. It's <laughs> spectacular. Um, and uh, I got to tell you, if I lived 40 miles closer, the Naps would be my pastors, and I would be here with you all. Uh, I love For 10 years, I've been general counsel at the Texas Methodist Foundation. And from the beginning, I've been here kind of in and out, a little bit a very, very small part of your story with the parking lot and did some facilitation a few years back. And, and uh, I love this church. Today is about this church and it's about you. Okay, it's about you. I do want to tell a story about the naps that came to mind. So, so you, you got a river that, that flows through this place and so they, they came, you know, the bishop said go, and they said yes. So they, they came here, and they were, they were taking a, a picnic with one of the Sunday school classes, and they were down there on the shore, and some of the inner tubes floated away. So Danielle gets up, walks across the water, grabs the two of them, comes back, puts them on the shore, and one of the members turned to the other and said, oh, they sent us a pastor who can't swim. No. Yeah. <laughs> Friends, um, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. And so what that means is I'm going to talk pretty frankly and candidly about the law, some legal stuff. But, um, and I will answer questions directly, which may surprise you about lawyers. We know how to answer que questions directly. But if it's a question that I think really is helpful to everybody to hear, Let's just dig into it, and if not, we can talk afterwards about it. So that's point one. Point two, friends, what we're about to do is heavy and hard, talking about this stuff. So I would tell you that we're not a, 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 a superstitious people, and that means that talking about it, planning about it, coming up with a way of dealing with it, has no impact on hastening or putting off the day when God might call me home or you home. Nonetheless, it's heavy stuff. I grew up as a kid really afraid, you know, step on a crack, break your mother's back, and, and that got in my head, and there was one day, I, I mean, I deeply, walking across the sidewalk, was afraid when I stepped on that crack. And, you know, whatever is in the mind of a five-year-old or six-year-old, that was a time when we talked about superstitions. Well, we are not a superstitious people. God holds your and my future. Nonetheless, because we're about to talk about some heavy stuff a little bit, just, just breathe. <laughs> what I do when I get a little bit anxious or afraid, I put my right hand over my heart and I breathe in, you are safe. You are safe. You are safe. So friends, if I see you gently touching your heart when I talk about things, I'll know that you're just coming back in the room. The foundation is gifting us this time together. Okay? It's, and it's a gift. I'm, I'm so grateful for this church in so many ways, but that I get to walk alongside you and Adam, I'm not done. If I can be some help to you and your team and to this church in the future, I will. But today, after the plates are cleared, there's a book over there, and that book is a workbook. And here's one of my hoped for outcomes today, that you hear something that I'm about to talk about that's in that book, and your takeaway after your aha, I've never done that, your takeaway would be to go home and calendar finishing uh, that part. Take, in other words, engaging it, opening the book and taking a pen and writing in it because it's very personal and it's about 
creating a plan. So this is, this is kind of approach avoidance time. Do some of you, anybody here ever jump to the back of a book, of a fiction book to see how it ends? Uh, okay, I, yeah. Friends, um, there can only be real transformation when we internalize our own story of what God has done in and through us in our lives, and then we're going to express it. So I want to talk about several of the things in that book that are important. And my story begins with Bill and Jane. So I sang in choir in a church about the age of this church for about 25 years. And uh, the church was taking care of my kids and my wife was involved in children's ministries. And I was that nice young lawyer sitting in the tenor section. And people would come to me to ask me to do their will. And Bill and Jane came in and uh, Jane was kind of the outs outspoken person of the two of them, but I, I gave Jane, I handed her, I said, look, here's a checklist of how to organize all of your affairs. And she said to me, and I quote, oh, I don't need that, I've got it all organized. And she didn't give it to me, right, the, the laugh is very appropriate. But four years later, their children, brought in those boxes when Bill and Jane had passed. And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly this little discussion about creating wills, and we did create wills, turned into about 10 hours of going through fi their financial matters because they hadn't taken that list, that checklist that reminded them of, about all of those things. The kids were mortified not because it was so hard or that they might miss something that their parents were gonna to give to them. They were mortified because they wanted to be good stewards. And, they, and, and Bill and Jane were good people, but they never realized that, that their, their children, their adult children would want to get this right. And they didn't give them the clue. So in that book is a checklist of, that'll, that'll jog your memory, and some of those things will be blank. I don't own mineral, mineral rights, I, I just tell you. And I don't have, really have any special collections. I have some really cool carpentry tools, but I don't have any collections. I live kind of, kind of liberated from stuff. But there may be things in there that you want to write down. Friends, I, my draft number was 15 in the Vietnam conflict. And it's the, uh, the draft stopped right after I was uh, called up, so I didn't have to serve. But there are people that served in the military throughout all of those years and even today. And, and, and frankly, you want an opportunity to write that stuff down. Because I will tell you, as my wife deals with the journey of her grandfather's passing and trying to do work with the VA and all of that, it's important to her. And it's important to the family, it's important heritage. I'm moving on to a new topic in that book. And, I'm, and this is really important. It's as important as the financial legal stuff we're about to get to. Every year I go off to Africa to spend three weeks in a village in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in my top left uh, drawer of my desk, I have a letter to the pastor. Now, and attached to it, I have the suggestions for scripture and music. Now, let me tell you the importance of that. My wife is a liturgical musician, and my two sons are composers. <laughs> and they're all deeply spiritual. And I want them to celebrate my life when that day comes and not overthink it. And I want the pastor to know those scriptures that are important to me. Now, I will tell you that I've got a place in my computer, one of those modern computer things, and I, I kind of update that every year because my life changes. God is speaking to me in different ways. But how wonderful, Adam, to have somebody hand you the scriptures and the songs that were so important to them. And what a gift to the kids just to, to hear that. You know, his eye is on the sparrow, frankly, makes me cry. How great thou art makes me cry. And the idea of the kids, uh, of the kids not wondering or having to worry about what dad would love, just getting back and let that wash over them. I think about 
why did dad choose Romans 8 verses 29 and following? You know that, you know that scripture? For I'm convinced that neither life nor death, nor powers of good or evil, nor nothing in all creation can separate me from the love of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Well, that's a write-me-down verse. <laughs> and, and that's one of my scriptures that shows up there a bunch. And I do a kind of a funny letter to them. I say, well, you know, if you're reading this, I'm really glad you weren't on the trip to Africa with me this time. And, uh, but here are some things to think about. So in this book, there's also something called a letter to loved ones. And I want to talk about that for a minute. So in the book, in the letter to loved ones, there's a, literally a blank page. And it's titled Letter to Loved Ones. How would you begin to tell your children or your beloved uh, in, a, in a letter what you think? I, I frankly had difficulty writing those until I, until I kind of hit on this reality. First, if you've successfully given the blessing of the father or the mother to the child, don't take it away. Don't judge, don't control, don't fix, don't advise, just concretely love them. If you're people that like to use big flowery language, I've always loved you, that's a really good line. But you want to get real specific and concrete. You know, I was watching you one day when you were doing this with your children, my grandchildren, and I was just marveled at that. And I wanted you to know that I was there and I saw it. So if I were to write that down to my daughter, what is she hearing from that? Dad cared, dad paid attention, dad saw this part of me that, that was a gift from God that gave me these skills to deal with these four children. And so I don't need to tell them everything about everything. I'm done, I'm done preaching to them, frankly. Um, I'm done preaching to them. I need to love their mother. I need to live generously in the world. I need to be a good, safe space to listen to them. But I'm done advising. Of course, I will put in my two cents. I can't help it because I'm a lawyer, but I'm pretty careful. And I always begin with, sons, you know a whole lot more than I do about cars, so what do you think? <laughs> Questions are powerful things, by the way, at this time of our lives and asking our kids and always begin with. And by the way, could I charge this table to snag a dessert for me in case this goes bad and I have to stop over quickly? <laughs> Good. Friends, what a gift it would be to have your finances organized, to have a, a letter that, that tells them what what about God's grace expressed in music and scripture really speaks to me in this season? What a blessing to have a letter that concretely lets them know they, they've been heard and valued. So those three pieces alone are really crucial. So right now I'm, hearing, I'm seeing some nods and some gentle smiles and I'm gonna give you a, a homework assignment. This is one of those moments that when you take that book, you, put it, you take it home and you put on the calendar, your family calendar, by such and such a date, have opened that book and worked at it. Now, you may, it may take you several tries, and you may work at it in stages. I mean, to work out the scriptural story of what really speaks to me, just be aware that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Take some time to breathe and find yourself fully present and just think about it and literally ask, God, what, is, what are the scriptures? Or you might want to talk to one of our pastors or, or somebody else who's done disciple Bible study or something and say, oh, oh, that's right, we have search engines on our computers now where we put in those key words that really speak to me. You mean that in 1 Kings 19, there was that story about Elijah on the mountaintop? And there was an earthquake and wind, and God wasn't in any of that. God was in the still, small voice speaking to me, and I didn't know where that came from. Well, it's Kings 119. I'll bet you that, one, that somebody in this room can find it if your computer can't. Play with some of those. Try some out. And then as time goes on, evolve that. 
And, if, and literally, if, if you're in Sunday school or doing your private study or you're in church and a scripture really speaks to you, I think that's the Holy Spirit nudging you. Write it down and go and sit with it and just kind of let it wash over you. And, and that's how you, you create that scripture. Does that, does that make sense? And what an incredible gift to your church and to the, your loved ones and especially to your family to do that sort of thing. Okay, new topic. Why are you here today? Well, I want to talk about that in a deep sense. You're here today because you love this church and you believe in it. And you've experienced God's grace here in different expressions. You've experienced what it means to have been lost and then found, as that beautiful hymn says. You've understood brokenness and reconciliation. You've learned conflict resolution skills as you've gone through building projects. <laughs> Pause for laugh. Um, you, you have learned to be the body of Christ and to love one another. You've created beautiful meals as you did today. You have, you have t tended and cared for people. You sent notes to them. You've called them to check in on them when you haven't seen them in, in a while. You, you have food trains when, um, when somebody finds themselves in the hospital and needing some help. All that's the very fabric of this church. What that is is you've experienced God's grace. Well, and you believe that this is the place where God is speaking to you. We know as Methodists, God speaks to all people at all times in so many different ways. But, but in this place, you found that concrete body of Christ. And no, you're not perfect. I love this church. But you're, but you're living out the gospel in a wonderful way. And everybody in this room is a part of it. So, so I want to tell you about Bill and Jane. Now, Bill and Jane knew that I was working in Juarez every week. I was building bunk beds down there. They knew I was going to Africa. They knew all of that stuff. And I, uh, I, I said to Bill and Jane, when they asked me to do their wills, I said, okay, be happy to do it. I'm going I'm to charge my church friend rate. Are there any lawyers in the room? Okay. Lawyers deserve to be paid. But I was going to charge my church friend rate. But I said, in exchange, I want to share with you what my wife and I have done and invite you to do that same consideration. You know what's coming. And, and the reason for that is, is that, candidly, your pastoral staff, who are extraordinary people, aren't going to have this discussion we're having today from the pulpit. And candidly, when you get to the lawyer's office, you're not going to have that discussion in the lawyer's office. You're going to have that discussion in your Sunday school class and today and with your loved ones and, to each, and, and among each other. And that discussion is, what part of, of, of what God has given me I want to, and these are the words from the Shema in Deuteronomy. By the way, you know the Shema because you've read it in Deuteronomy. It's Methodists often use it as a call to worship. But let me tell you, it's those cool words in Mark 12 where a follower of the law, and we lawyers don't really get a good gig in the New Testament, but the follower of the law is listening to Jesus, as he's arguing with the, um, is he responding to the questions of the, of the Pharisees, and they're talking about, well, who marries, who's married to the woman when you all get to heaven, and there's six brothers, and they're talking about all sorts of stuff, and the scripture is so interesting. It says, and the lawyer uh, listened to Jesus' answers and found them good. Well, that's a little pretentious. <laughs> and he says, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Now you know the Shema that comes next. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is as important or as great as this. Love the other uh, as you would love yourself. So, do you guys, did you ever hear the Beverly Hillbilly song? Come listen to a story about a man named Jed. I've just put into your mind an earworm. That, that when you hear that story, you know that song, you know the rest of the verses, right? Right? What Jesus was doing 
at a time when there were no books, there were some scriptures, not everybody could read and not everybody had access to it. What he was doing was reciting what in any time the children of Israel gathered, they'd recite the Shema. And that was the Shema. But do you know how it continues? Because this is what everybody was hearing. It continues with, take these things into your heart. Teach them to your children. Talk about it when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, when you walk along the road. Wear it as a sign or a symbol on your wrist. Post it on your forehead. Post it on the doorpost. And then it goes on to say, and don't forget this when you come into the land that I have prepared for you and you get all the benefits from the land that you didn't work for. Yeah, thank you for the amen on that, Adam. That's the Shema. It's, it's Deuteronomy 6. So they were hearing Jesus started out, and it was like he was playing the, hymn, the, the first melody line, and they were filling in the rest of the symphony. And, and frankly, if you've done disciple Bible class or you've talked to uh, people who are, um, who are Jewish, they'll tell you that all of the Hebrew scriptures, the focal point of all the Hebrew scriptures is not Genesis, the beginning. It's not the story of Abram saying yes and everything that came after it. It's not the Exodus story. And it's not even what happens on Deuteronomy 5, which are the 10 gotta do's and must do's. The focal point for the children of Israel, and dare I say for us in the Hebrew scriptures, is Deuteronomy 6. It was Jesus made it the focal point for all of us. That's, that's, that's the place that all the scriptures hinge on. And, and it's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful scripture. Well, the part that I'm inviting us and our foundation is inviting us uh, at this church to do is to remember that we take these things into our heart and we teach them to our children. Back to Jane and Bill. So they were getting my church friend rate. I didn't, I, I asked them some big questions about taxes and big numbers uh, because that was a responsible thing to do. I said, no, we're, we're, not, we're not close to that yet. And that should have given me a clue to be a little stronger. And I said, well, let me tell you uh, what my wife and I do. And seriously, I did this for 20 years. And it's too late to complain to the Texas Bar Association about me. Um, but I would say, I'd say, look, my wife and I have named our current year's unpaid pledge as a debt of our estate. Why? Because there are some people on the finance committee that have planned on it. And there are people's lives who have planned on it. And there's electric bills that come in and all of that. So I would literally, I'd make it, an un, I would make it a bill uh, uh, of my estate, the unpaid pledge. Now, I said the second thing is, is that, is that and then I would name what we were passionate about um, and, and say that uh, we've kind of made a gift for that in our wills. And it was one of the ministries of the church. And so I would say to Bill and Jane, this is that long pause and you know, I'm. I was just as encouraging and just as in the moment as I am with you now. And you know what Bill and Jane said? Oh, no, that's okay. We don't need to do that. <laughs> now, many other couples had done that. That suddenly lit them up. And they said, they said to themselves, is that possible? I mean, we could do that? But Bill and Jane said no. So when Bill and Jane's kids came, and they were inheriting what turned out to be about a $4 million estate. And they asked me to do their wills. And when I got to the place of sharing with them what I had, um, what my wife and I had done and inviting them into that space, what do you think their answer was? No, that's okay. We don't need to do that. The parents had missed the opportunity to take it into their hearts and tell their next generation, tell the next generation of the wonderful things God has done. Now, here's the part that's, that puzzled me. Bill and Jane loved that church. They always sat in that place right down there that was their pew. 
They always sat there, always. They were there every Sunday, and they loved that church. And for some reason, and there was wonderful preaching going on at that church, they didn't make the connection. And you know what? I never had the guts to stand in front of that church and tell them about this opportunity. I didn't do the work of you, Dr. Moore. And um, our foundation never talked about it. Church never talked about that stuff. And it was the stuff that lay people needed to talk to. Friends, as, as I share with some people at the table, for 20 years I've been involved in Africa. I was involved with um, doing ministries in um, uh, right outside of Juarez, across from El Paso. For two years I've been a missionary in Asia. So I've done a bunch of that stuff. Frankly, I've taught disciple Bible study after being a disciple Bible dropout. Um, I, oh, I was way too busy for it until God kind of <laughs> hit me over the side of the head the next year. The reason why I'm saying all of this, oh, I'm going to add one more. So I've played music on about 20 walks to Emmaus and about five Kairos. None of that stuff, not any of it, had the impact on me that Willie Frank Ford had. She's about 90 pounds soaking wet. She was about 80 years old or north of 80. And they asked her to sit, get up there and, and talk about stewardship. It was that time of year. And you know what she said to the pastor that asked her, oh, pastor, nobody needs to hear from me. I'm too whatever. Too old, too small, too creaky a voice. She got up to speak. And I was one of those people, this is prior to choir and all that other stuff. I was sitting about three rows from the back in this fairly dark church, fairly old and dark and not had an upgraded lighting, but that was perfect for me. The pastor would say, let us pray. My head would go down and nothing would happen. Total emptiness. I was hearing great preaching going on. My wife would ask the kids in the car on the way home, so what do you think of the sermon today? And I wouldn't have a clue. I mean, I was in a desert time. And Willie Frank Ford gets up there, and we were in El Paso, Texas, and she says, uh, I need to tell you about my husband and I. We were a young couple. We were members of this church. It was in the 30s. That's how long ago this was. The, uh, so the 30s in El Paso, you have an idea what that was like? They had an old hardware, uh, 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 good um, like a wall, a Walmart or something. It's called P the Poplar. And Poplar had a credit union with it. And they made a pledge to their church that they loved. And uh, they, uh, they fell short on it. They're both working people, but they fell short. So they went down to the Poplar. This is, this is a young couple in their 20s. In the 30s in El, in El Paso, Texas, they went down to the credit union and borrowed money to pay their unpaid promise to the church. And then, now I was real smart. I had a degree in economics, I was a lawyer. And I was doing the math on that, thinking practically what Willie Frank was talking about. She was talking about paying the poplar back as she was paying her current year promise to the church. And I was ashamed. Some people get there not through shame, it was shame. Probably there didn't need to be anybody else in that church that day but me. I remember every word of it. I remember what she was wearing, and I remember where she stood. I remember every word. And when I finally got that piece right for the church, it was loving my children, loving my wife, and I finally got that piece right, guess what happened? This incredible, wonderful, fertile journey. It's as if God... I wasn't usable. God didn't know what to make of me yet till I got to a stance where I could finally hear. And suddenly my prayer life and scripture and all of that really began to blossom because I got that piece right. And I finally got concept attainment, not through what the pastors had said, but through this humble 80-year-old plus woman that scared me to death. <laughs> And you know why she scared me? Because week after week, she would search me out, look me in the eye, and ask me how I was doing. So I would begin to avoid her because I knew she could really see I was in a really dark place. 
I was in a desert, and she was one of those people that sometimes we overlook who are the real treasures of a church, and she saw through me, and God had kind of put it on her heart. I want to talk, uh, give you a moment to talk um, for, for Greg to talk, uh, Dr. Moore, and the reason is is because some people have come before all of us and love this church and build it. Is there anybody here who built this beautiful church? You've been building it over the years. You've renovated it. Some of you have been here for 36 years. I, I did listen to that story. But the fact is, whether you've been here for a year or 36 or more, we're standing on the shoulders of giants that God was speaking to and preparing a place for you and God is still renewing the face of the earth. And one of the ways God is doing that is through these wonderful young pastors. Forgive me for being patronizing. But, <laughs> but that's what God's doing. But also through you and me in our role, in our season of life. And I, wanted, I, I want Dr. Moore to talk for a moment about the, the foundation here at First Church San Marcos. Thank you, Tom. Well, I've been involved in the foundation for probably about eight years and uh, didn't know much about it when I was appointed to it, but I've really found that it is my passion um, because it is an institution that plans not for today or tomorrow, but for when none of us are here. Um, and, you know, I think about this church and about the legacy of those who came before. And when I look at the sanctuary, that embodies the church to me, and I know I'm not supposed to say it that that way so let me explain <laughs> when I look at the sanctuary I do see a be beautiful building but what I see are the people that in 1893 when this town of San Marcos was only 4,000 people built that huge structure they were not building it for themselves they had to be building it for us and I think that's what we need to do um, and through the foundation we can do that is that we need to look not for our needs today or tomorrow or even next year, but 150 years from now. And uh, I think many of y'all in this room have donated to the foundation before, and uh, we sure appreciate it. But I think the foundation is able to continue to keep this church moving forward, not only the sanctuary preservation, but general ministries in the future as we go forward. Yeah. Guys, I need to confess, I've got a superpower. When I talk about the law, my wife's eyes immediately. Talk about the law, but I want to talk about it in an aggressive way. Did you know? Well, we have the most elegant probate system in Texas. Now, when those people gather in Austin, all those laws they don't always get it right but I got to tell you they got it right with the probate system if you have a will and it's properly executed signed by two witnesses whether notarized or not signed by two witnesses and if you have in that will the magic words and I want my executor to serve without bond kind of magic words then then what happens is essentially you're going to end up with one hearing Court. It's going to be filed. Notice is going to be posted. All the lawyers know how to do this. It's filed and posted. You, you can even do it pro se, but it's easier to just turn it over to a lawyer. Then you, you go to court, and the judge says, Is that the signature for your dad or your mom or your loved one? Yes. Did you look around to see if there's any, any, any other wills? I did, and I didn't find any. And the, the judge will say, I'm so sorry for, for your loss, but would you raise your right hand? And I'm going to make you the executor. And then point down to the district clerk's office or the probate's office and say, go get some letters testamentary, and they're about 2 or $3 each. And you need to turn in an inventory. That sounds like a lot, but it's pretty easy to do, especially because your mom or dad used that book and lined it all out for you. They filed the inventory, and the will is done. And the wishes that the decedent put in there just get to get executed. For example, I'll be really candid with you. Um, 
I just, I've been married 45 years and it gets better all the time, but married a girl I met in high school, the daughter of a Methodist minister. <laughs> Everything I have is gonna go to her. It already is, I was a, I found out of COVID, it's not really my house, it's her house and I was a visitor <laughs> as I moved from New back home. But in any event, um, the, the last of us to, to leave, then it gets divided up, up among the kids. What happens if, I, if you don't have a will? It's very different. The state legislature has a whole different plan. My wife gets a life estate interest in my half of the house ownership. There's an administrator that's, that's appointed so that good title can be vested in her, uh, but it's also vested in the children, which creates more problems for a title company down the line. You have a situation where she gets a portion and my kids get a portion, and there aren't enough portions for her to be comfortable and to, and to get by, candidly. I'm the richest guy I know, friends, because of the, the work in Africa and what God has done in my life. I, I count myself rich. That being said, a third or a half of what I have is really not going to be enough for my wife to get by however long she lives. I'll tell you, when my wife's grandmother died, great-grandmother died at 104, she had her three siblings who were still alive with her. She was, she was 104, and the siblings were north of 100. I've totally got to up my game. I have totally got to up my game on that. In any event, for all of that thinking, will is really important, friends. Because if you don't do it, then money for the, um, the money comes out of the estate to appoint, in, to appoint somebody for all the unknown heirs. I, I've been such a busy lawyer and busy with the church. I don't have any unknown heirs. <laughs> uh, I'll just tell you. I mean, I married my high school sweet, sweetheart. But even in that situation without a will, they would appoint a lawyer to look for the unknown heirs and to interview my children and my wife. And they'd have to go through the questions of, well, your dad was away on all those business trips as a lawyer. Has anybody ever contacted you or showed up? I mean, they would literally ask those questions. And the estate pays for that attorney to do that, that work. And then th there's a number of hearings and it's a very expensive process when if you if you went to an office of a lawyer and gave the office gave the lawyer that that packet and said can you tell me what's a fair price that's a fair question to ask a lawyer says a lawyer of 35 years just give me a fair price i and the lawyer may ask a few more questions and then pay it or find another lawyer if it's not right but that money that you spend to run out the ground ball, to finish it, to get ready, is gonna save thousands of dollars for the estate. And it's gonna make everything so much elegant, more elegant and, and, and go easier. Something called, and if this is for a trivial pursuit, if there's ever a category for Latin, um, Latin phrases for lawyers, and there won't be, but maybe I need to write it. But something called a munument of title Immunement of title. You could act if there's a will, if the estate is organized by meaningful debts other than the debt on the house or the car, you can have a munument of title that means there really isn't anything but this one hearing and title passes. And I mean, it's a wonderfully elegant, straightforward solution to that. So who should not have a will? Not anybody. Whether people are living week to week on social security or they, have, they owe more in their house than they, uh, than, um, than they certainly intended to at this point in their life, you still want to, want to have that opportunity for them to do that processing. Friends, for all the other couples other than Bill and Jane, think about this dynamic. Bill and Jane were the exception now, I, 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 I'm enough of a scientist to tell you this isn't statistically accurate, but it's anecdotally accurate. Every other time I went through the will with the children and they learned that a portion of their parents' estate went to the church they loved or that passion, 
every time, and, and frank, frankly, in the secular world, not God's world, they just lost a portion of their inheritance. In God's world, where we take these things into our heart and tell the next generation of the wonderful things God has done, in God's world, I saw nothing but joy or affirmation. I saw, yeah, that's just like mom. She loved that. That's just like dad. That's just like them to have done that. And it brought them joy. And candidly, it makes their portion of whatever they inherit sacred because the first fruits have gone to that place. Try this, friends. The first check I write on January 1 goes to our church's endowment. It's the first, church, it's the first check I write. And that's different from what we've said we were going to give. We have capital campaigns, and there's one going on at the church, and we pledge to it. You all have had capital campaigns. You know all about that sort of thing. But what if you had a capital campaign for your endowment where you just were going to give that extra little bit every year for four or five years? And what if Greg or someone would say, friends, um, we, started a, uh, we started a capital campaign for our endowment, and we already have pledges of $100,000 or 200000 Who else is in? And somebody like me sitting three rows from the back that wasn't really reading about the balance sheet and was kind of picking up some of what the pastor said, but not all, they might be moved to say, well, I could do that. Henry Nowen talks about, um, he's a, 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 a priest, a Catholic priest, and Henry Nowen has some beautiful books, but, but the theology of giving that he talked about talked about this work that Dr. Moore and the Endowment Committee and you all are about as conversion work, transformative work. So we Methodists talk about going deep in our discipleship. If I were to ask you, say, look, I, I love this church and I know you do too, would, would you consider being one of the key starters of this campaign, whatever that is? That's a gift to him. That's a gift to invite him in to do that work that's his to do. A guy by the name of Bill Enright from the Lake Foundation, um, funded by Lilly, that is, as you all may know. Enright says that every person, essentially says everybody serving on the finance committee or stewardship committee, everybody in, really in the church ought to be doing this interior work of naming the hold that God has on them. It's not a pop quiz, so you don't need to name it to everybody at the table. But you need to have your Willie Frank Ford story in mind. What was the transformative, surprising gift that moved you deeper in your discipleship or started a discernment process or a journey or reached into the desert to carry to lead you out? What is that story? At what age did that happen? Why is it? that you have not only found a measure of God's love for you through this church, but, but looked at how I might respond to it. We'll leave you with one more story. And remember, you're going to, before you leave, you're gonna grab a book, because it's a gift from your foundation, and take it. it. Has nothing about Texas Methodist Foundation. This is all about your foundation at this church, because you all have been great partners, and even if you weren't with us, I get to be here and do this work. So be at peace. This is not charging your foundation anything other than a really nice lunch. And I, and I get to be a small part of your story, a very small part. But grab a book, go home and calendar that date. I'm gonna leave, leave you with this aha story. True story. Church in Houston had this um, fellow, the people had kind of lost track of, of him. He was a, a widower. They'd lost track of his story, but he was uh, one of the people that handed out bulletins. And if he were to take you down to, or walk you down, it was a pretty slow walk as he lived out his last days and weeks and months. But he was there every Sunday. So what did that tell you? He loved that church. He'd experienced deep, profound healing, change, encouragement, nurturing at that church. 
He'd had the scriptures opened up to him. He'd experienced the beautiful music. This is a church in Southern Houston. Think NASA engineer. And people had forgotten his story. But this is a church that never talked about their endowment. It took a lot of courage for Dr. Moore to get up. That's not his day game to get up and talk to everybody. He's better at it than he thinks he is. But if lay people are talking to other lay people about this, like what's going on today, what happened next wouldn't happen. When this person passed, this humble, fine usher that loved that church, he left every dollar of his $8 million estate to other charities. Not one dollar for that church he loved. Think, what happened. Think he got angry one day? No. Nobody talked about it. Nobody invited in. Nobody gave him the invitation. Nobody said, hey, we have some really serious people with a heart for this church and a heart for the future and planting, planting seeds for trees that they'll never sit under, as you heard from Dr. Moore a moment ago. There are people that they could trust that were doing that stewarding and that caregiving work. And if we're not talking about it, we're not talking about the gifts for, uh, or, or how the money helped with the budget or helped with whatever that what is. If we're not talking about it and celebrating it, and you don't have to use dollars and cents, if you're not talking about it, then you're missing an opportunity for God to open the lives and the hearts of the people who are hearing it. So think Willie Frank Ford, not a public speaker, shaky voice, with a person who was kind of like a whale, I was under the ground most of the time, under the water most of the time, and then the preacher might say, let us sing, or let us stand if you're able, and I would stand up, and then I'd go back down and not hear anything. She caught me when I, when, I, when I was up at the surface and listening. That was God's work, doing that work. God is gonna hear from you in ways that God won't hear from me or Willie Frank or Adam or your team. And what are we doing? We're just participating in the building of God's love and preparing a place for people to come here long after us. And we're doing it with joy and courage and we're doing it with, um, with being, uh, being aware that my job is not to fix everything and neither is yours. Your job is not to raise a budget. Your job is not to raise the foundation to twice what it is. Your job is to count on the Holy Spirit coming with power, as we read in Acts 1, verse 8. And you will be my witnesses, said Jesus, in Jerusalem, San Marcos, Judea, the areas of San Marcos that have never heard about this wonderful church, Samaria, the region, and even to the ends of the earth. You're, you're the, the member of the church doing work in, in Rwanda. Even at the ends of the earth, you have no idea how God will take your small gift, your promise. And you know what we've learned in the giving world? When, you're, when you make that statement in your will, or you make that capital campaign pledge, or you make that outright gift, when you do that, your regular giving goes up as well. Why is that? Well, in the secular world, it makes no sense because we, we deal in terms of scarcity and limits and budgets. But in God's world, scarcity becomes abundance. And once I get the plumb line right, any carpenters in the room just had one of those moments, mission trips and kids and plumb line, let's get a straight cement wall and let's get that plumb line right. Once we get your and my plumb line right, then we'll know when we're away from the plumb line how to find our way back. We'll know that the plumb line looks a lot like the Shema. Looks a lot like talking about it when I wake up in the morning, when I walk along the road, when I go to bed at night. And in those years, it meant talking about it and it meant gifts for others. But in our life, it doesn't mean me waking up and talking about Jesus all day long. It means living the gospel and it means candidly using the resources God has given me taking it into my heart and teaching my children and not forgetting it when I come into the abundance that God has prepared for me. So friends, all of these materials are there and we can be a discussion partner. If somebody in here wants to approach a pastor 
or Dr. Moore and say, look, I'd like to have a deeper conversation, but I'd like to have it confidentially, count us in, and we can do that uh, because that's more comfortable. But there's all sorts of wonderful ways. I love paying taxes. I pay every dollar that's due, but there are ways that I can do this work of supporting my church in a way that saves me taxes. Well, not everybody knows that, how to do that. So it, it can be done, and there's some materials about that. We can talk about that at a later time. Friends, I've taken all of your time. I've got some dessert to eat, um, <laughs> but I will stop if you want to visit. Let's consider a year or two from now that, that you all have told others, oh, yeah, you could trust Stanton. He's joyful. He talks about the gospel. He loves this church. And let's, let's invite more people into the discussion. That being said, what a joy to meet each of you. And I'm aware that, uh, that this is really, the roots are deep in this church. This is holy ground. And I'm so glad that you three pastors found your way here and said, yes, Lord, yes. Yeah, thank you for that willingness to do that. And I'm done. Thank you.